OK, hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the first uh, seminar of the term for the School of Applied Sciences at Abertay University. I'm Chris Watkins, seminar organiser and senior lecturer in psychology. So just to update you, we have four really interesting speakers um, scheduled between now and the end of term. So please keep up to date via Eventbrite and sign up via our page if you wish to attend. Um, and of course, I'm happy to hear from postgraduate students or staff if they wish to nominate a speaker for term two, which will run um, the start of February until the end of March, the same time and day. A reminder about our Q&A, as usual, if you have a question, you can post um, throughout within the Q&A um, in the top right hand corner and we'll have a dedicated session for um, questions and answers uh, for around about 15 minutes up until the end. Um, OK, so it's a great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, as it's not often that I have the honour of introducing someone who is a co-founder of an entire field of study. Um, so Professor Randolph Nessie um, is speaking to us from his Centre for Evolution and Medicine at Arizona State University. Uh, by way of background, uh, Randolph is a trained uh, physician. And having completed his education around uh, the late 1970s before taking up uh, various posts throughout his career but based mainly uh, at the University of Michigan uh, gaining various accolades and delivering various keynote talks in the process and um, he was awarded the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Human Behaviour and Evolution Society in 2014 um, and was also recognised in that year as a distinguished a life Fellow of the American Psychiatric Association. Um, Randolph has published in excess of uh, 300 papers and many um, books for a general audience as well and was the co-founder alongside uh, George Williams of the fields um, Evolutionary Psychiatry and Evolutionary Medicine. Uh, so today he will speak to us um, about his research linked in part to his recent book uh, Good, Fe um, Good Reasons for Bad Feelings. Uh, so Randy, thank you very much for coming to speak to us all today, and I'll hand over to you just now. Thanks so much for that generous introduction, Chris, and hi, everybody. Um, I certainly wish I could be with you in person. I wouldn't be, or it would have been possible. I was supposed to spend the entire week in the UK this week uh, for talks sponsored by the Evolutionary Psychiatry Special Interest Group of the Royal College of Psychiatry. But alas, for the second year in a row, that's all canceled. They're cautious about COVID. Maybe next year I'll come. A lot of the work I'm talking with you about uh, actually got started when I did a sabbatical at UCL. I uh, had the wonderful privilege of working with Ruth Mace and Jillian Bentley there and Louis Wolpert and a lot of other wonderful people. And that's when I started my shift from evolutionary medicine in general to evolutionary psychiatry. It's now only 20 years later, um, and that's finally coming to fruition, and I feel like I'm confident enough to, um, to, to talk about it. So my topic is good reasons for bad feelings, but really I'm talking about evolutionary psychiatry in general. And while I wish I was still at the Center for Evolution and Medicine, that's been turned over to Ken Buto, who runs it now. Um, and I'm just a research professor, so that means I can do what I want to, including giving lovely talks. Please, please, all of you, Type your questions in as they occur to you, because what's fun for me about this is talking with you as best we can. So this is a pretty little quiet psychiatrist's office, and I must say that I absolutely love practicing psychiatry, and it's the most useful and interesting medical profession I can possibly imagine. You get to know people and really almost everybody can be helped, at least if they will keep coming. Very satisfying work. Um, I helped to run the anxiety disorders clinic and developed the, one of the first anxiety disorders clinics at the University of Michigan over a period of 40 years in the department there. But sometimes I'd look out my window and I'd see an entirely different scene. I just imagine what we weren't treating. And that's an image of the tsunami in Indonesia. But I just that, that's the emotional wreckage that's actually going on out there. And those of us in our pretty little offices treating patients one by one can't begin to deal with this. And so I kept thinking about, geez, why is it that there are so many problems for so many people? And furthermore, why is psychiatry so plagued by controversy? Um, all these smart people who want to be good scientists and most are good scientists, but the field is still ridiculed quite often. And Kaplan and Sayadaw is the main textbook in psychiatry. 
And on the very first page of the main edition, 2009, they said, there's little reason to believe that these diagnostic categories are valid. I mean, really? Um, Tom Insel ran the National Institutes of Mental Health for many, many years. And at the termination of that, he says, whatever we've been doing for five decades, it ain't working. Maybe we just need to rethink this whole approach with no validated biomarkers and too little in the way of novel medical treatment since 1980, it's time to rethink mental disorders. Now his idea of rethinking it is trying harder to go into the brain and find the abnormalities. But my thesis is that we've been missing a whole basic science uh, and it's about time that we use it because everybody in animal behavior bases it on evolution. So these are the different things I was exposed to as a psychiatrist. Um, I was very interested in the social psychology and family therapy and epidemiology, all these different things. You notice the background there? It's the Hundred Years War. Um, everybody just keeps fighting as if they want the dominance of each of their teams. And I just couldn't stand it. I don't think I wanted to find some way of bringing it all together. Something is missing. And that took me to this building, which is the Museum of Natural History at the University of Michigan, where I was invited to a seminar of animal behavior folks, including Richard Alexander and Bobby Lowe and Barb Smuts. Um, and they invited me in very generously, and I didn't know anything. Um, but within minutes, they said, of course, everybody in psychiatry studies evolution. I said, well, no, not really. Um, and they said, well, why not? It's the foundation for everything. And that was the point where I began understanding that I really only had used half of biology, only the approximate half. And I had no idea about the evolutionary half. I hope you are all familiar with this already, um, based from Ernst Meyer and in more elaborated forms, uh, Nico Tinbergen. One kind of question, all of my medical education and biology education was about how the mind works, psychological levels, brain levels. But the other half of it that I had no idea about was asking, why does this mechanism exist? How does it influence fitness? How does it increase fitness? You really need both to get a full explanation. So again, my thesis is that evolutionary biology is a missing science that can pull everything together in psychiatry. It offers for psychiatry what physiology offers for the rest of medicine. And most of all, it encourages us to ask an entirely new set of questions. Why do emotions exist at all? They don't have to. Uh, why are the mental mechanisms so fragile that they're prone to break? And in general, the same question we ask for evolutionary medicine, why didn't natural selection do a better job? Evolutionary biology can tie all of these together. It's the missing link. Selection in general is something also I didn't understand very well. And here's a very simple image of what, how selection works. Um, at least we used to carry coins in our pockets. Fewer of us do these days now that we can use our credit cards or Apple Pay for almost everything. But every night I used to bring a pocket full of change in my pocket and throw it in my jar. And then in the morning, I would take out the silver coins. You might do the same thing. So the question is, why is that jar on the right hand side all full of pennies? And of course, the answer is selection. A random selection of coins goes in at the left and a non-random selection of coins results because of a selection process. Natural selection is just the exact same thing, acting on genes. And it's so simple when inherited variations in a trait influence the number of offspring, the trait will change over generations. And those are Darwin's pigeons. He was fascinated by pigeons and he wrote letters to pigeon fanciers all over the UK asking, do you think they all came from one stock or are they different species to begin with? Even before he went to the Galapagos. For most of us, it's more familiar to think about dogs. Um, imagine just 10,000 years from wolf to all those different kinds of dogs. And this is a more marvelous example. These are Hawaiian honey creepers. Notice there are different shapes of beaks. Why are their beaks different? Approximate explanation has to do with the genes and development, but an evolutionary explanation has to do with how those beaks work or how they don't work. This one in the middle is the actual beak of the actual Huey, but this one is too curved. This one is too short. This one is way too curved. This one is too straight. Those beaks reach into the flowers to get nectar and they'd better be just right to get the most nectar. These birds that are not in the center get less nectar and have fewer offspring. It's as simple as that. 
Which brings us to the next point that natural selection mostly keeps things the same. It doesn't change things. It keeps them the same because whatever works, works. Finally, onto brains, you can't see any difference between those brains, but they are different. And the one in the center actually makes that individual do things that ends up surviving longer and having more offspring. And as a result, selection shapes brains that maximize reproduction. And here's the kicker, often at the expense of health and happiness. It's one of the saddest discoveries I've come to in this work is that natural selection does not in fact shape us for health or happiness. It shapes us to maximize reproduction. This is why sex is such a problem. So here are the questions we can talk about. Why do diseases exist at all? Why are anxiety and depression so common? How can we understand individual life situations? And if there's time at the end, we can talk a little bit about why altruism and pro-social emotions exist, addictions and schizophrenia. So as for why disease exists at all, you got to ask yourself, I mean, if natural selection can make something so great, um, why does it screw up so badly? I mean, the heart, I mean, it's absolutely astounding and it keeps working. I mean, the fuel pump in your car uh, is not going to keep working for 80 years. It might give you eight or 10, but the heart keeps working. That's astounding. The eye, the exact clear tissue, exactly where it's needed is just amazing. And the hand is equally amazing. Every single nerve and bone and tendon and, and joint in the right place to make this kind of thing possible. It's absolutely astounding. On the other hand, you get to the second half of medical school and here's what you see. The appendix, why is that sitting there? The spine, you think you have spine problems and there must be something wrong with you. No, we all have bad spines. And then that's a real problem. Um, why on earth does that baby have to get born through that narrow ring of bone? Um, you know, Freud asked him, what do women want? I can tell you what women want. What women really would like is a zipper. Uh, it's ridiculous for babies to come through that narrow ring of bone. So these are all shared traits, not what makes some people get sick, but why we all are vulnerable to disease. So this is the article that George Williams and I wrote in 1991. Mine was first in 1984. Evolutionary psychiatry really got started before evolutionary medicine. But it was soon clear that I was never going to convince psychiatrists to take evolution seriously unless they recognized that it was useful for medicine as a whole. And that's grown very nicely. So why did selection leave us vulnerable? Uh, the old answer is that natural selection has limits. The mutations happen. And that's what I was taught in medical school and what a lot of doctors still believe. A second reason is it's slow, so it can't catch us up with changes of environments. A third one is that it shapes trade-offs that limit robustness. A fourth is it maximizes reproduction, not health. And finally, a lot of defenses such as pain, fever, and nausea, and anxiety and depression can seem like the diseases. We'll go through each of these quite quickly, but the big picture here is that you know, those of us in medicine have been taking a mechanics point of view. How does it work? What's wrong? How can we fix it? What we're advocating is an entirely different point of view, an engineer's point of view, asking why do all models of that particular species or that particular car have a flaw that makes them prone to fail in that particular way? So this is evolutionary medicine. It is not a special mode of practice. There's nothing alternative or radical about it. It's just using the basic science of evolutionary biology to better treat individual diseases. And that's grown very nicely. Um, anybody who's interested should go to evmed.org and check it out, sign up for our free newsletter or join the society. And in fact, in two hours, um, I'll be hosting a meeting of Club EvMed. Club EvMed is a journal club that you're all welcome to. It's going to be um, today as a discussion by Paul Turner, uh, who's the chair of evolutionary biology at Yale. He's talking about how his evolutionary study has led him to use phages, those are viruses that infect bacteria, to cure people who had otherwise incurable infections. Use nature's uh, attack on bacteria. It's absolutely fascinating work. And some of the kinds of things that have come from evolutionary medicine that are practical, I had no idea when we got this started. Evolutionary psychiatry got a great start with books by Brent Winograd and McGuire and Troisi. Simon Baron Cohen, there in the UK, edited a marvelous book. EPSIG, E P S I G, 
dot org is the group in the Royal College. You can sign up for their newsletter as well. That's really probably the best source for this field. Um, other good books, and that's the book I'd like you to buy uh, based on today's lecture. Uh, that's a Penguin book, um, very readable. It's not a textbook, but it tries to explain why we really should um, can make sense of psychiatry if we use evolution. This is a brand new book, I think by Britt as well, Mike Abrams, about the new CBT based on evolution. Here's the first question. Why are anxiety and depression so common? First question, are they so common? So this is the prevalence of mental and substance abuse disorders worldwide in 2017. Look at that. Anxiety and depression overwhelmingly are the mental health disorders. After that are the addictions, uh, alcohol and drug use. Only after that do we get bipolar, which is yet another mood disorder, and schizophrenia and eating disorders are way, way, way less common. We've got to figure out why anxiety and depression are so common. And the answer is that emotions are usually symptoms, not diseases. Fundamental mistake we've been making is to think about them as if they're always abnormal. So why do emotions exist at all? Again, we're asking new questions with this perspective. And the answer is that they're useful if they're expressed in the right situation. Like sweating, pain, and cough, they're unpleasant. And their unpleasantness is also part of their utility. And they're useful if they're expressed in the right situation. So this was my whole theme, and I spent a whole year just trying to figure out you know, what's this emotions function. And after reading everything I could in the emotions literature for a year, I finally realized that's the wrong question. Each emotion does not correspond to a function. They have functions, but many functions and they're overlapping. The right question is, in what situation is this emotion useful? And I've been very gratified that that point has really pretty much taken over in emotions research. People are realizing it's the situation, um, not the function that we need to look to to understand emotions. Emotions are special states shaped by natural selection that improve coping in situations that influence fitness. And this is a diagram I drew to il illustrate that. Um, you know, there are two kinds of situations that influence fitness, opportunities where you can get something and bad situations where you can lose something. And that explains why emotions are either positive or negative. But the big point of this diagram is to see those overlapping branches. The emotions are not distinctly separate from one another. They evolve from each other because they're special states and they're overlapping. And all these discussions amongst anxiety or evolution and or emotion researchers for the last 100 years about is it basic emotions or are there two dimensions or three dimensions? Um, those are pre-evolutionary views. There's no distinct set of emotions and they have overlapping fuzzy boundaries. So I wish I could help everyone in psychiatry and psychology understand that negative emotions are adaptations that are useful in certain situations. If you're facing a risk of loss, anxiety is useful to prevent that loss. If you experience a loss, sadness is useful by helping you to find what you've lost, to replace it if you have other, otherwise can't, to warn other people about the loss. But low mood is different, and immediately we're onto new territory here. A lot of people think that low mood is the same as sadness. I don't think so. Um, sad, you lose something, you experience sadness, and then you go on. But if you're trapped pursuing an unreachable goal and you're just wasting effort on it, low mood keeps escalating until you give up that pursuit. Then there are all the other emotions that are neglected, and I wish we could bring each of them in because there are disorders of each of them. Now, this is a diagram I also drew about you know, the situations that are aroused in pursuing goals. Um, if there are opportunities, you feel hope ahead of time and happiness if you succeed and disappointment if you fail. If there's a threat, you experience anxiety or fear if it's a more physical kind of thing, relief if you succeed, and sadness at the social loss or pain at a physical loss. I thought this was a new idea. I was really proud of myself until I talked with my philosopher colleagues. They said, oh, by the way, this is exactly what Plato, Stoic, Cicero, and Hume have been saying for hundreds of years. And I still wonder why we in psychiatry have lost track of genuine knowledge that's so important. This made me take a different perspective with my patients. To understand a person's emotions, we need to find out not just why that person has depression, but uh, in terms of their pre uh, pre 
uh, temptation in, in terms of their you know, likelihood of having it, we need to understand what that person is trying to do in life, whether they're trying to get or avoid, what opportunities, obstacles, threats, and strategies are in their life now, and what do they expect is going to happen. So here's a diagram of anxiety. How much is the right amount? Well, most of us have something like the right amount, even though it doesn't feel like it. And some people have way too much. They have anxiety disorders. And I'm not sure how many of you know Isaac Marks in London at, he, at the Institute of Psychiatry, but he was my colleague. We wrote a wonderful article together about fear and fitness. And he pointed out to me that, hey, there's another anxiety disorder. There's too little anxiety. These people never come for treatment, but you might find them in an unemployment line or a divorce court or worse yet, the morgue. So here are two common assumptions about anxiety. The first one is that normal anxiety should be useful most of the time. The second assumption is that if a person's experiencing useless anxiety, it must be that the mechanisms that regulate anxiety must be defective somehow. And in the next few minutes, I'm going to try to convince you that both of these assumptions are false. I'm going to try to convince you that normal anxiety is usually useless but normal. How can that be? Well, sometimes there's useful anxiety, right? Anxiety can stop you from doing something stupid. And sometimes, and a lot of people actually do have defective anxiety regulation mechanisms. I certainly saw hundreds of them in the clinic who had a parent who had the same problem and a sister who had the same problem and kids who had the same problem, or they had PTSD from overwhelming exposure to terrible trauma. There, there is useful anxiety. And there's truly pathological anxiety, but there are all these things in between. The smoke detector principle explains a lot of it. Modern environments explain a lot of it. Things that are good for our genes but bad for us explain some. And sensitization gone awry. So these are four explanations for normal useless anxiety. Quick talk about each one of them. The smoke, I mean, we all have smoke detectors in our places we live and they go off mostly because we burn our toast. But we put up with the false alarms because we want to be absolutely sure that it goes off every time there's a real fire because that is so much more important. So what if you're in Africa and you're a hunter gatherer and you hear a noise behind a rock? Should you run away? Well, you can't run away every single time or you'd never get any food or water. How, how loud should that noise be before you run away? It depends on the probability it's a lion. You should run away whenever the probability that it's a lion is greater than the cost of having a panic attack versus the cost if you don't have a panic attack and the lion's actually there. Maybe you can see the lion in that picture. Maybe you don't. Should you run away? Well, it depends on the cost of panic. We'll call that 100 calories. And the cost of not having panic if there's a lion there, that's 100,000 calories. And that means the ratio is 1,000 to 1. And that means that it's optimum to flee whenever the probability of a lion being there is greater than one and a thousand. When I first did this calculation, I thought that's wrong. That's crazy. That would mean that 999 panic attacks are normal but useless, but normal. But then I realized this is right. And this is exactly what my patients were struggling with. It is a system that gives rise to many, many normal but useless instances of panic attacks. And then I started talking to my patients about this. You don't have to talk about evolution. You just talk about you know, smoke detectors and explain to them that what you're having is a useful response, but it's a false alarm. And that was so reassuring to patients. Instead of feeling like they're just defective persons or they have a brain disease, they were able to recognize that there are advantages as well as disadvantages of having a sensitive panic mechanism. So that's the smoke detector principle, and it explains why we can block all kinds of things in medicine. It's not just anxiety. Uh, most of medicine consists not of curing people, but of relieving their symptoms of pain, cough, fever, and nausea. And we can do that safely because of the smoke detector principle, because natural selection shapes the regulation mechanisms in ways that maximize fitness, not happiness. Huge implications for psychopharmacology. People say, Dr. Nessie, you think that anxiety and depression are useful, therefore we shouldn't do drugs. No, <laughs> you know, pain is useful, but it's very good to relieve pain. Okay, the second explanation for why um, painful emotions are usually normal but useless 
is because we live in an environment entirely different uh, from those that our ancestors lived in. Um, we experience way too much fear um, because our environments are safe now. Uh, very few of us have to deal with predators, um, although there are dangerous people on the streets. And, but the worst thing is that envy is aroused. I mean, it used to be there were 30 people uh, and they were all relatives and everybody had pretty much the same amount of stuff. And the others billionaires and, and plain old millionaires. Um, it leads, and plus we have social media so we can see the lives of the rich and famous. Uh, it leads most people to be dissatisfied with themselves, with their ability, their appearance, their wealth, their social position, and striving uh, for trying to do something to rise in those hierarchies. Um, it doesn't work, um, but if you don't do it at all, you get left behind. Third explanation for why things are normal but useless is that it benefits our genes. Uh, I have a whole separate lecture about sex. I mean, sex, let's face it, it's a problem. Um, yes, it's extremely pleasurable. It better be pleasurable because it gets us in such trouble. Um, and after you do it, until modern times, you got to take care of kids for about 15 years or so. Um, Lust, jealousy, envy, pride, wishes for revenge, all these. There's so many things uh, that we would be better damping down uh, for our own welfare and society's welfare. But that's not how natural selection works. It does whatever is best for the individual and that individual's genes. And the last is adaptive sensitization. Uh, the Royal Society had a meeting on evolution and chronic pain a couple of years ago that I went to, and that you know, spurred some deep thinking about how natural selection adjusts the sensitivity of these mechanisms. I mean, if you repeatedly experience a lion at the local watering hole, it's really sen it's sensible for your panic system to become more sensitive. Um, if you experience safety for 100 times in a row, it's good for that system to become less sensitive. And that simple principle has very, been very helpful for my patients who need to take medications for getting rid of their panic. It used to be they'd say, are, are we just covering over the symptoms, Dr. Nessie? And, and now I was able to say, not that I understood, I was able to say, no, no, what we're doing is blocking panic attacks for a few months so that the whole system desensitizes and recognizes it. actually the system, the whole system is pretty safe. Also, in pain, as well as anxiety, you can get positive feedback disorders. Most bad panic disorders really are fear of panic symptoms. And when a person has panic symptoms and they think, oh my God, I'm having a heart attack, I'm having a stroke, it must be a brain tumor. Um, and the symptoms themselves uh, become a source of fear. And of course, then people start avoiding high heart rates and things, and, and they just sit quietly in a chair until their heart rate goes up anyhow, and then they worry about that. And it feeds back into a full-blown panic attack. Likewise for chronic pain, um, repeated episodes of pain uh, that are controlled often make the pain system more sensitive, a crucial idea that's coming to fore in understanding chronic pain. So this is really helpful in the clinic. It's not a cure-all, it's not a new method of treatment, but it helps us decide. And this patient in this situation, is the emotion normal? And a very different question, is it useful? Because it can be normal, but useless. And explaining to patients that anxiety is usually normal but useless and using any safe treatment to stop the useless bad feelings. Depression is harder. I mean, anxiety is clear. Hey, there's danger. Better avoid it. Stay away from it. Low mood, that doesn't seem useful at all. But we have to ask the question again, why does motivation vary at all? And the answer is there are good times and bad times. In good times, there's a big payoff for a little bit of effort. In bad times, nothing's going to pay off no matter what you do. And this is the propitiousness of the situation. Mood tracks propitiousness so that in good situations where you get a big payoff for a low investment, mood skyrockets, then it plummets when there's no payoff. It's wayfinding. But again, it's not wayfinding to health or happiness. It's wayfinding to maximum reproduction. So it, there are sadly uh, situations in life when the costs are greater than the benefits but through every single available action. In that case, what's the best thing to do? Nothing. The model for that situation is don't just do something, stand there. So mood guides wayfinding about what we're going to be doing. It allocates our effort to different domains of sex, status, friends, and group membership and our different strategies. We tend to do what works and put more effort in when it works and other times to pull back and wait. 
And again, this all by itself is helpful to patients and to all of us to realize that you know, there's meaning to mood. Um, and if you're feeling down and hopeless and, and pessimistic about things, it might be that that's a time to pull back and wait some until times are better or until you find a different strategy. But again, a lot of these things benefit our genes, not us. This is not new at all. This is William Blake um, talking about the ultimate depressogenic situation. Blake says, if any could desire what he is incapable of possessing, despair must be his eternal lot. So I ask my patients, is there something you're trying to do that seems so important you can't give it up even though it seems like you'll never succeed? Are you trapped pursuing an unreachable goal? And my psychiatry residents tell me this is the single most useful thing I've ever taught them. And it, it often reveals what's going on in a person's life when a regular interview does not. Despair, it's always darkest just before it goes pitch black. So what do we do differently? Well, we ask that question. We try to understand people's lives one by one, not just in generalizations with check boxes saying, you know, um, you know, have you been under stress lately? We need to consider all possible causes of depression and conduct a review of social systems. I mean, in medicine, we conduct a review, I'm not sure if it's here, we conduct a review of systems to see what problems a person might have in their renal system, in their lungs, in their heart, in their skin, in their uh, uh, inflammatory system. We need to do the same in psychology and psychiatry for social systems. We need to consider all causes together. I mean, everybody wants things to be simple. They want to be, it's social situations that cause mental problems, or it's genes that cause them, or it's drugs that cause them, or it's marriages that cause them. I mean, come on, everybody. Um, it's way more interesting and complicated than that. Um, there's top-down causes, life situations influence the brain. There's bottom-up causes where the brain causes emotions. But most of it's that wiggly line where everything interacts with everything into a tangle. And we have to accept the reality of this organic complexity to do justice to what's actually going on there. It also means we have three treatments, kinds of treatments, and we can do any, any of them. We can change the situation with making life changes or psychotherapy. And I think the best therapists spend hours trying to really understand that person's life situation and why they stay stuck in a bad situation. The meaning of the situation can be changed often with cognitive behavioral therapy, and then we can change the brain with drugs or other kinds of treatments. So all of these treatments can be useful. I don't think we should get stuck on just one of them. This brings us to how we can use evolution to better understand individuals. One of my huge themes is quit trying to make these generalizations about everyone with depression or everybody with panic disorder. Stop it. Um, they have different explanations. This is the review of systems in medicine. And this, this is a review of social systems. The mnemonic is S-O-C-I-A-L for the six main kinds of resources that people are striving for. Social support, friends, status, occupation and social roles, children, family, kin, income and material resources, abilities, appearance and health, love and sex. And the problem is that when you pursue one of those, you can't have as much energy or resources to pursue the others. And when we're lying in bed thinking about what am I going to do, usually it's because putting effort into getting one of those things takes away from one of the others. And this idea that everybody can have everything to the max, it's just false. Um, if you're going to put everything into your occupation and be super duper, um, there's going to be sacrifices for these other things. We've already talked about that one and we'll skip that one. So for each area, what we really want to find out is what the person has, what they want, what they're planning to do, what they expect, uh, what they're repressing. I mean, this business of unconscious processes are very important. And summarizing it up with their current concerns and what emotions they're experiencing and whether those emotions are useful or pathological or normal but useless. This is my little diagram of causes of depression and anxiety. Notice at the end, they all have to go through brain mechanisms, but my gosh, there are all these different pathways. I'll give you a few, few examples of a few patients. Um, here's somebody who was in a bad life situation and their psychological mechanisms led to brain, brain problems and anxiety and depression. Uh, this person had a spouse who left them and after that they had no income and were all alone. 
this person is different. This person had the same genes as their parents and their sister and brother, and everybody had a serious depression. Bad, bad. This person got sick and worried that their spouse might leave. Bad life situation causes all those things. This person had early abuse and all of its sequelae. Not only were they abused in ways that damaged them, and it, those that abuse meant that they probably had the same genes as their abusing parents. And worse yet, it screws up their whole social situation later in life. And then the ch real challenging patients for those of us in psychiatry and psychology are, are these, where it seems like everything is going on. It's all too common. I mean, this, it, it's not simple, gang. Um, and I think we should not pretend it's simple. Although our human minds constantly want to simplify things to one cause, one treatment, one kind of thing. Evolution does not make us treat people simply. It encourages us to think much more deeply about each individual as an individual. So the conclusion from this part is that evolutionary biology is psychiatry's missing foundation. Um, it's the origins of desires and emotions. Bad feelings are usually normal but useless. And we need to understand each individual as an individual. And when we do this, we can be more effective at relieving symptoms, even though it's not a miracle cure or a new way of treatment. And this makes us just like the rest of medicine. And I see I've, I've been speeding along here a little bit. I hope I'm not talking too fast and you can hear me OK. Um, I think there's enough time to go into one of those other topics if you'd like me to. But I'm going to ask Chris whether he'd prefer doing that or if we should take some questions first and then possibly go on to one of these other topics. What do you think, Chris? Uh, we still have about sort of five or ten minutes. Is that is okay if you wish to continue, um, Randy? And that's uh, there might be some hot questions about this depression and anxiety stuff. Tell me if there are any there that we can deal with, or or else I'll just go on and people can type their questions in then. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, no no new questions at the minute, but please do feel free to post everyone. Um, okay. Yes, if you wish to continue. Good question, everybody. That that's why I'm here. Okay, here's the next big one. What about altruism? I mean, you all heard these big debates about selfish genes and all that kind of thing. Hey, why on earth should anybody be moral? Why should anybody be generous? Why should anybody uh, do things that are good for the group or other people at a cost to themselves? This has been the central conundrum of evolution and social behavior, and I've been very disturbed by it. So everybody thought selection shaped individuals to do what's good for the group, but in 1966, George Williams published Adaptation and Natural Selection. You'll notice, by the way, that he's my co-author and creator of evolutionary medicine. Notice those lemmings jumping into the drink. It used to be thought uh, that lemmings all jumped into the drink because food was very scarce in the early, early spring. And if they all kept eating, they'd all starve and the species would go extinct. And that little illustration shows the problem with that. Uh, one lemming that decides to stay home and reproduce um, is going to pass on its genes. The ones who jump into the drink, their genes are lost. That select, and that's a very simple version of George Williams' whole book. Um, individuals who do things that reproduce their own reproduction, their genes are gone, even if that benefits the group. In 1976, Richard Dawkins uh, popularized this idea of um, as a selfish gene, leading to a firestorm of criticism that continues to this day with people grossly misunderstanding the whole business. But this transformed everybody's worldview who really took it seriously. I now look at a woods like that, a lovely forest. Why on earth are those trees so tall? Why don't they all just cooperate? They're all the same species. Why don't they just all grow three feet tall and save all that effort? Um, instead of making all that wood, great effort and cost, why don't they just grow three feet tall and make seeds and have done with it? And the answer is that they're competing with each other for light. So wasteful, but that's the way life is. These are selfish genes, and I think it's an insight as threatening to humans as the Copernican, Darwinian, and Freudian revolutions. This led me to write an article, a uh, chapter actually, for a book about the selfish gene. It was a follow-up book, why a lot of people with selfish genes are really pretty nice, except for their hatred of the idea of the selfish gene. So from a psychiatrist's perspective, neurotics outnumber sociopaths 10 to 1. 
And furthermore, if you believe everybody's self-interested, and this is a terrible side effect of simplistic selfish gene thinking, that will be true for you. Because you're, only, you're, only, you're not going to have any friends who are generous. You're just going to have other people who are selfish. Likewise, if you believe love is impossible, that will be true for you too. Because you know, who's going to love somebody who doesn't believe in love and commitment? And early social schemas are so hard to change. People who grow up in families that induce certain feelings um, and beliefs about human nature. My favorite psychological question, my, my one time um, try to understand somebody is to say, yeah, can you tell me what you think about human nature? And some people say, yeah, yeah people are pretty nice generally. You got to be careful. Um, other people will say, oh, I think people are basically good. But some people say, you know, I think really everybody's just out for themselves. And those views change not only how a person lives, but what other people are around them. It literally changes their environment. It's so important for psychotherapists to understand this. This has made me worry that selfish genes are a toxic meme because if people start believing that people are selfish, it leads to social corrosion. And my question for about 20 years has been, how can we explain real altruism, commitment, morality, and all the rest? So this is the greatest advance in social science in the last 100 years, is explaining social behavior. Uh, the first one was kin selection. Bill Hamilton pointed out that individuals you help might have the exact same genes you do, identical by descent, and therefore you're helping your own genes. <coughs> Bob Trivers and others pointed out that trading favors benefits both parties. So if you do that successfully, it works well. <coughs> And finally, self-interest, um, a lot of times everybody's doing what's best for themselves, but it turns out to benefit the group too. Cultural group selection has been proposed and clearly is important. Groups with more cooperators do better. And there's sometimes where we smart humans can simply plan uh, to enforce cooperation, doing things like imposing taxes and using them to defend us against enemies and to provide for highways and social goods. But there's something missing. I think that light bulb actually is off the coast of Scotland. I've been using that illustration for some years. It's apparently there are lifeboat squads where volunteers practice going out and rescuing people at the risk of their own lives. Why do they do that? Why do they do something that's risky and moral for the good of others? And it's very expensive. And I think these human moral tendencies are as expensive as a peacock's tail. Now, peacock's tail is explained because the peacocks with the most gaudy tails get mates. But in social selection, which is my explanation uh, for a lot of moral capacities, the choice isn't just to choose a mate, the choice is of, of a social partner. Who do, you want, who do you want to be your partner on a project? Who do you want to admit to your department? Uh, what department do you want to join? What, what job do you want to take? What job wants to take you? A lot of what we do in life is making choices of who we want to associate with. And who do we want to associate with? We want to ability associate with people who have a lot of resources, who share them with us, and who have capacities for empathy, morality, and commitment, and who are sensitive to our needs. What this shapes are extraordinary pro-social tendencies. And it also explains why we're so damned concerned about what other people think about us with almost everybody having substantial social anxiety, wondering if other people are going to like them or not. Now, this has many different names. It's not just my idea. Social selection is the idea is the name came up with by Mary Jane West Eberhardt, an insect biologist. A partner choice, uh, Hammerstein and Ronald Noe, taking it from an economics perspective. Competitive altruism uh, has been studied by some psychologists, showing that people actually compete to be more altruistic than others. Can't explain that with any of the other theories very well. And then there's co-evolution of choosiness and cooperation. So where do we see this kind of thing happening? Really every place, um, searching for a job or economic exchange. I mean, why is there a baker's dozen? Because you'd rather go to the baker who gives you 13 instead of 12. <laughs> um, and the baker, and this also um, speaks for those of you who are social psychologists to the interesting boundary between instrumental relationships that are simple exchanges and communal relationships, where there's something more than simple exchange going on, and it implies a commitment 
um, and, and the like. And those committed relationships are just way more valuable than pure instrumental relationships because they give you help when you really need it, when you're not going to be you know, paying it back. And if you look at hospices and, and you look at people who stick with their friends when they're dying, uh, people, a lot of people do that. Some people don't, but a lot of people do. And it needs explanation. And it's, it's so wonderful that it, that it exists when it does exist. But then we come to what I've treated for 40 years as social anxiety. I mean, most people have substantial social anxiety. All sensible people care a lot what other people think about them. And most of us have too much anxiety. There are some who have too little anxiety. You know them. You're talking with them at a party and they just go on and on and on, oblivious to you and everything around them, just bragging about themselves. And they just don't have any anxiety uh, to guide them. Um, so what about neurosis? Um, what are the benefits of that whole tendency? Well, high empathy at being a preferred partner, but also neurotics are very sensitive to criticism. And what's worse, they tend to attract people who are exploiters, who use their guilt and manipulate them. You see oh, so many marriages where there's a neurotic and, and someone who exploits them. And the neurotic can't leave because they're neurotic and the exploiter knows it. These are tough, tough cases to, to treat. Very, very hard. And then there's sociopathy. Um, the, there are people who, some people just don't have pro-social emotions, but others are pretty good at it. Um, and they manipulate others with threats and deception. They make promises. They look you in the eye and say, I'm going to love you forever. I'll join your, I'll join your program and be committed to your program. And then you discover that, no, actually, uh, they were just lying to you. Um, uh, Linda Mealy, back now 30 years ago, suggested it might be a strategy, um, not a defect. And I think that question is still not answered properly. Um, it doesn't seem that we, we used to think that if people with sociopathy beat basically had brain abnormalities because there were soft neurological signs. More recent studies don't seem to have confirmed that. So I, I'm not at all sure it's a short term strategy, but it also we should be aware that the whole business of deep pro-social emotions and cooperation is new. I mean, this is just in the past, you know, few tens of thousands of years. Um, and it wouldn't be at all surprising if natural selection is continuing to go round and around uh, with a fairly flat fitness curve, shaping these pro-social tendencies to a greater extent or lesser extent. So the conclusion of this is that people were selected to compete to be preferred partners. And this results in extreme altruism compared with any other species, but also extreme social sensitivity and vulnerability to neuroticism and internalizing disorders in general. I think this is a kind of evolutionary foundation that every psychologist and, and, uh, and clinician uh, should be aware of. Um, it's a foundation for understanding diagnosis, research, and treatment. And it gets us away from simplistic things about its group selection or its cultural group selection. Those are also potentially important. This is not an all-purpose explanation. But understanding how you can even possibly get runaway selection for trying to become a preferred partner, I think, is a really important uh, foundation for understanding relationships. This is a brand new book just out just a couple of months ago by Arvid Agren. I highly recommend it. He's a biologist who was at Oxford uh, with studying bacterial cooperation. And he's discovered along with uh, other people there that you know, bacteria can cooperate because the enforcement of cooperation actually benefits the enforcer instead of being a cost that has to be explained at the group level. He's now moved to Harvard, and I look forward to more work from him. Look, look it up if you want a really good book about all of this.